Hello, I'm Cara Dahl Russell, and today I'm going to be sharing with you a pre-concert lecture that was first presented for the Mid-Atlantic Symphony Orchestra in 2018. The first half of the program opened and closed with two classical era romances, one by Beethoven and one by Mozart. In between those two standards of concert repertoire was a new composition, a work called Black Bend by Daniel Visconti. Now, some of you may know that as a member of the music faculty at Salisbury University, I have become a regular participant in the annual new music concert performance of the music department. As a musician, I enjoy the challenge that new works can present. There is often a combination of new techniques, difficult time signatures, rhythms, or melody or lack of melody. I don't always love new music, and sometimes I like a piece that, but I know it will be difficult for an audience to sit through or listen to. I try to introduce the work so that people will understand what I like about it, and also how I think about it, that, and something that I'm going to be trying to put across in the performance of it. Frankly, there's also a lot of new music that I simply don't like. And there are new compositions that I do not even consider to be music, but I consider them to be composed sound, which is valid. And in the movies, it's very lucrative. But personally, I don't consider that to be music. So probably, like most of you, I have an interest in knowing what's new, but I don't necessarily want to live with it. And that's okay. Beyond all of that, any work of any style or time period that is completely unfamiliar, even a rediscovered or lost work can be hard to take in, either personally or for, and also for an audience. And this is why good music programming usually does what was done in this program. It places new music in between or with pieces that are well-known works. In complete disclosure, as I was preparing for this speech, I read an interview with this composer that made me very angry. The interviewer's premise was that classical music and the concert world is old, fusty, and irrelevant. And this composer, Daniel Visconti, in that interview basically agreed with that statement. And I simply disagree with that premise. I personally think we have a culture that is no longer acquainting children with classical concert music as it used to. And it is that ignorance and lack of familiarity is breeding the idea that concerts are an other world that is odd, archaic, and irrelevant. Since most of you listening to me would be concert regulars or classical music regulars, it's safe to say that you also agree with me that the concert hall and its music has its own relevance. Visconti also reinforced the trite put down that a composer is an old dead white man in a wig at the same time that he said he wanted to change that. As a working artist, I have lived and worked in a time period when making performance relevant has been the hue and cry. I personally don't buy that historic things need to be made relevant. I think that Ashley has much more to do with marketing and cash flow than with legitimate art or the appreciation of an audience. Example, I feel that Shakespeare is relevant. History is relevant. Art from any time period is relevant. Historic music is relevant. They do not need to be made relevant. If it's understood and valued and even fully historical productions are relevant by being performed with understanding. For me, it is that transcendence of time that makes art relevance. It places us in a continuum 
of understanding how deeply similar we are today to the people of the past. So that's my soapbox, and I can step down from my soapbox now. So, and I can now say a bit about this composer, Daniel Visconti. I think it's important to note that he is a guitarist, and even though he played violin, and that was the, in, and that was his in, entree into the study of composition in his youth, he had an active dislike for violin lessons. He had an and for classical music, and his interest was in folk music, blues, rock, and popular music as well. Understandably, by extension, he takes his academic understanding of compositional structure and blends it with the music that he feels connected to. And he's very vocal about this being an intentional facet of his work. So you'll want to listen for that when you listen to his music, this blending of academic compositional structure and folk, blues, rock, pop. In doing so, he's very much in tune with the trends that are currently going on in conservatories, and they tend to call it breaking down boundaries. It's common enough to be a catchword. Now, I will admit, I'm a skeptic with this only because I've seen from the performance side, both in theater and music, how this works. Over time, we have seen other genres being incorporated and accepted in the concert hall. At the same time, it is much more rare to see classical music correspondingly being incorporated into bars and folk concerts. There's been a little movement in that direction too, but in my experience, it usually means classical musicians playing works like this, these kind of crossover works, and getting a lot of kudos and street cred for not playing classical music. But anyway, this is a trend in performance concept which is being upheld in music schools. Along with these kind of conceptual trends in performance practice, there are also trends in modern music composition that you should be aware of before you listen to this piece too. So it's worth knowing some ways that this work absolutely follows and fits in to a norm of current trends. Number one, it is highly atmospheric. Like a film score is atmospheric. Film music today is much more about creating and sustaining an underlying mood than say the film music of the 1940s, which was also atmospheric, but it was much more prominent and it was much more melodic and theme driven. You might have a recurring theme throughout the film. Today, this film music can often be an extended tone or a building tone or a building dissonance and then an explosion of sound. That, so you'll want to listen for that atmospheric quality. This work is also pulse driven. That's kind of what I was talking about before with the different elements can build and build. This is pulse driven and that is another current trend in modern composition. Whether the pulse is percussive or electronic, many new compositions have an inception in a rhythmic concept, and any other element of the piece grows out of that underlying rhythm. As mentioned before, this work intentionally combines musical forms that are usually separate from the concert hall into a concert composition. In this case, it is blues fiddle that eventually takes center stage. If you don't like country fiddle playing or blues fiddle, and if you don't like an extended improvisational style of fiddle playing, you may find this a very challenging and difficult piece. If that's the case, it's only 10 minutes long. And if you appreciate nothing else, you should be able to marvel at the contrast between the works 
that are played by various musicians, that they can play this music as well as the classics. And that's training. That's training and capability. And so when you sit in a concert and then first you hear a piece by Beethoven and then Mozart and in the middle of it you hear a modern work based on country fiddle playing, you need to appreciate the diversity of the musical languages that these musicians perform and excel at. Having laid that framework, there are many things that you will understand about this work that will help you follow the musical path that it, ta it takes. It's based on a legend. It's based on a legend about a train wreck in which people died at Black Bend and the location is said to be haunted. We can all agree that is a great, interesting, compelling concept that has a lot of inherent levels built into it. This piece begins with a pulse that becomes more insistent, representing the rhythm of the train on the tracks. And the piece fades away with this eventually, so that it is the atmospheric scenic setting of the piece. Added to that is sonic effect. It represents rippling of the water, the wind in the trees, the rush of the wind by the train, the dissonance of wailing. Is it the horn of the train? Is it screams? Is it souls in torment? Is it the screeching of the train? All of these possibilities are in that music. The strings, and in particular the fiddle, eventually begin a blues-style melody which grows and changes. In classical terms, we would call this a theme and variation. So you want to be aware of that theme and variation component. In particular, this theme and variation, the theme becomes increasingly frenetic, perhaps demonic, representing the unrestful spirits, with possibly a nod to the historic connection of Paganini's violin and how he was supposed to have made a deal with the devil. One way to think about this work structurally would be a blues song that you'd hear in a bar that is a theme and variation that gets more and more wild and improvisational. And then you take that song and you set that song into your atmospheric setting. And this is a technique that we all know and we're familiar with, perhaps without being aware of it. Most of us are familiar with hearing orchestral arrangements of songs that put a long, large orchestral introduction before the song starts. And then the song comes in, and then the song fades away into a resetting of that original framework before closing. Basically, that's the structure of this piece, Black Bend. So even if all of these sound elements are new to you. Hopefully, being aware of all of those facets will give you a good idea of the concepts that influence this piece, how the sound is built, and how the layers of storytelling, of musical storytelling, are all going on and all wrapped around some truly impressive fiddling. Enjoy. Thank you.